Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a senior principal at Geosynta Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDAP and ESCCP. Today's event focuses on DOD-funded research on insulation adaptation efforts in response to changes in the hydrologic cycle under non-stationary climate conditions. Our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Ken Kunkel from North Carolina Institute for Climate at NC State, and he'll talk about his research to estimate the effects of climate change on rainfall events and his efforts to revise intensity, duration, frequency, or IDF curves. Ken's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Second, uh, we'll have Dr. Jonas Demisi from Washington State University, and Jonas will talk about his research to update storm and flood IDF curves for select military installations. And these revisions can then be used to address stormwater design standards. Jonas's talk will also be followed by a brief Q&A session, and we will conclude the, the webinar with a longer Q&A session uh, with both of our speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you're unable to download Zoom, you may view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you continue to have difficulties with the slides or if your screen freezes, please try keying in Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh of your screen. If you're accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. And if you continue to have difficulties, just call into the conference line shown here and provide it to you in your registration confirmation email. You can also submit a comment using the chat box, but only use the chat box for comments associated with technical difficulties. Any questions that you have for the speakers should be used or inputted into the Q&A box. In case of continued difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Note that we will uh, be live streaming this webinar on the CERTIP and ESDCP YouTube channel, and that's another option uh, for following today's proceedings. The broadcast uh, for this webinar will be listen only. Please submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not have to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to submit them well in advance of the Q&A sessions. And when you do submit them, we ask that you please add your organization name at the end of your questions so that we can identify you. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kurt Preston, who is the Startup and ESCCP Program Manager for Resource Conservation and Resiliency. Dr. Preston has tracked his career between civilian university and military positions. And prior to his current position with Startup, Kurt was a faculty member and research administrator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he led faculty development efforts to improve research competitiveness. And in this position, he also works with technology transfer personnel, academic departments, and colleges to build the university's research capability. In addition, Kurt has served as a member of Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board. Kurt, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's uh, CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. 
CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are uh, designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs. With much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by CERTIP and ESTCP. The underlying objective is sustaining Department of Defense ranges, facilities, and operations. This, as you can imagine, is a broad undertaking. It takes the form of looking at maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate impacts, unexploded ordnance and munitions, constituents, as well as other environmental drivers. One key environmental driver is the reduction of current and future environmental liabilities. This involves addressing contamination from past practices including impacts to groundwater, soil, and sediment, UXO contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. The second part of this is pollution prevention with a focus on eliminating likely environmental pollutants or hazardous materials in manufacturing, maintenance, and operation of our installations. We have several main focus areas for research and development at CERTIP and ESTCP as shown here. Installation resilience is the topic covered in today's webinar. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from all of our program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including advances in stormwater monitoring, and the development of best management practices for treatment, corrosion mitigation and predictive analysis for DOD weapon systems, applying open source tools to optimize building operations, and forensic techniques for differentiating PFAS sources. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. Registration is now open for the 2021 CERTIP and ESTCP Symposium, which will be conducted virtually between November 30th and December 3rd of this year. This event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Finally, I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our web, webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of this webcast. Finally, I hope you enjoy the webinar today. Thank you so much, Kurt. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ken Kunkel who is a research professor, professor of atmospheric sciences at North Carolina State University and lead scientist for assessments with the North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies. Uh, Dr. Kunkel is an author on the third and fourth U.S. national climate assessments, and he has published over 170 scientific journal articles and book chapters on related topics. He earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Southern Illinois University and master's and doctoral degrees in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ken, we're very happy to have you today. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much. 
My first slide here shows an, uh, an outline of my presentation. I'll begin by uh, stating the problem that I addressed in this research and also uh, describe the paradigm for the research approach that we used. In this project, we did um, extensive analysis of historical data. I'll talk about that, particularly with regard to trends in extreme precipitation, and also show some information about future projections. Uh, that particular information uh, has major implications for infrastructure resilience. And to that end, we developed uh, some methods for estimating new intensity duration frequency values that incorporate uh, future climate change. I'll show some of the results from that analysis, and then I'll end with some conclusions and the benefits to the DOD. So the fundamental problem that we face is uh, in this particular area is how will global warming due to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations change the risk of extreme precipitation events. Uh, the primary effect is that a warmer world has more atmospheric water vapor. That's not the whole story, but that's the major one. So um, this particular slide illustrates um, the way we approach this project. If one thinks about extreme precipitation events, there are really two major factors you can boil it down to. One is you need water vapor, and usually lots of it. And number two, you need a weather system that will cause precipitation, essentially will cause upward vertical motion in the atmosphere. Now, if we look at the first component and ask, well, how might global warming change that? Well, if you look on the left, I show a graphic of the projected changes in global temperature from global climate models under a very high emissions scenario, and it's showing very large warming by the end of this century. Now, there's a basic physical principle that uh, operates here, and that is that the saturated value of water vapor in the atmosphere is a very strong function of temperature, and it increases by almost 7% per degree Celsius. If we think about large warming, what that means for saturation water vapor pressure are very large increases in that, which is illustrated on the graphic on the right. That in turn leads at least to the potential or capacity for increased amounts of rainfall. Now, global temperature increases and the associated changes in the climate system will also change the meteorology, the weather systems that cause extreme precipitation, or what I'm referring to here as the opportunity. The way that that might change is much less clear than the case with water vapor. And in this project, we did a lot of exploration of the weather system component of extreme precipitation. So uh, since there is quite a bit of uncertainty about weather system changes, we can form kind of a first order hypothesis for future changes in extreme precipitation. And that is that Atmospheric water vapor, which will increase in response to warming, and it will increase according to this approximate 7% per degree Celsius relationship, which is known as the clausius clapeyron relationship. And the second part of the hypothesis is that, well, extreme precipitation will actually increase at the same rate, essentially 7% per degree Celsius. Um, so we did quite a bit, as I said before, historical analysis. And one of the pieces of this historical analysis was to look at trends in extreme precipitation. Uh, we did this with a set of data from long-term observing stations and using multiple metrics. We looked at durations of one, two, three, up to 30 days, seven durations altogether. And we also looked at events that exceed the threshold for various recurrence intervals from one to 20 years. In this analysis, we had 35 combinations of durations and return intervals. We identified about 3,000 stations that have relatively complete data for the period of 1949 to 2016. So we were looking at a 68 year record. This graphic 
summarizes the results of that project. So to get your bearings, I've got 10 tables here. There's nine tables that represent the regions in the U.S., nine regions in the U.S. Each of those tables consists of 35 cells. That, are, that is this 35 combinations of duration and recurrence interval. Uh, plus, I have a national aggregate table on the lower left. The teal colored uh, cells indicate increasing trends. The, the uh, brownish colors indicate decreasing trends. Well, you should just be able to look at this quickly without focusing and see that almost every cell is teal colored. That is, in much of the U.S., and particularly the eastern three quarters of the nation, every one of these cells is teal colored, indicating upward trends. The only exception is the far west, where we have a mix of upward and downward trends. But if you look at these closely, they're actually quite small. Essentially, we have no indication of kind of systematic upward or downward trends in the far west. The national aggregate also indicates all duration uh, and return interval combinations show upward trends. Next, we turn to an historical analysis of extreme precipitation events and how that relates to water vapor content in the atmosphere. We use two different uh, metrics for this analysis. One is the annual maximum series. What this is, is for a particular station, this would consist of a time series of the largest daily precipitation amount in each year. So in a 68 year record, we would have 68 values, one per year. We also looked at something called the par partial duration series. This consists of all events exceeding a threshold, in this case, a one-year recurrence interval uh, threshold. Once again, for a 68-year period, that, indicate, that would uh, mean 68 events. Um, but in this case, they could be scattered through the record. There might be some years with none. There might be other years uh, with more than one. Uh, the annual maximum series, just as a side note, is what is used by NOAA, the National Weather Service, in computing NOAA Atlas 14 values. So that's sort of their starting point for estimating return values is a statistical analysis of the annual maximum series. Uh, our water vapor metric was uh, a metric called precipitable water. This is essentially a vertical integral of water vapor in the atmosphere from the surface up through the troposphere. And we got this from a NOAA product, um, a reanalysis, which is essentially an estimate of the state of the atmosphere. Okay, this summarizes the results of that analysis. Here we have on the vertical axis is the precipitation amount in these extreme events. And just to kind of reorient this, th these are only extreme events that we're looking at here, a statistical summary of our findings. Uh, the horizontal axis is our water vapor metric, precipitable water, and we've been the values into various categories of precipitable water, and then show our, the statistical characteristics of each bin. The real key message here is that we find this very solid, strong relationship in the historical record between extreme precipitation amounts and atmospheric water vapor. It's a monotonically increasing function, if you look at this, um, and uh, provides support for what happens, what, what, for what our hypothesis is for the future, that extreme precipitation will increase as water vapor increases. Okay, so I talked about this basic hypothesis that serves as a starting point. There is an alternative hypothesis uh, that extreme precipitation amounts will increase at greater than the clausius clapeyron rate. This would arise from latent heat release in convection in these storms, where increases in atmospheric water vapor result in increases in latent heat release in these convective cells. This increases the buoyancy and therefore the vigor of these convective cells. It would actually increase the rate beyond the clausius clapeyron rate. Now, the question is, what did we find in our historical analysis? 
We do find some evidence for that um, at the high values of precipitable water, not at the low values of precipitable water, but at high values of precipitable water. The historical data seem to support that. And we've actually incorporated that into our adjustment factors uh, for IDF values. Okay, uh, well, what about changes in water vapor in the future? Do we find these changes? Well, of course, that's the future. We don't know what will happen, but we can look at global climate models and see what do they uh, say about the future. So what I'm showing here is an analysis of precipitable water, and it's not average precipitable water, it's the maximum precipitable water in a set of CMIP-5 models, uh, 13 models from CMIP-5, and it's showing for this for the end of the 21st century relative to the end of the 20th century. What it shows are increases everywhere and actually large increases. If you look at the color scale on the right hand side, you will notice that the colors actually start at 20. That's a 20% increase. So almost everywhere globally, water vapor, this metric, increases by at least 20%. Over the US, we're talking values of 25 to 40%. So we're seeing very, very large changes in the climate models in water vapor as they warm. What about extreme precipitation in the models? Does that actually follow uh, this uh, expectation? Well, what I did here was analyze the newest suite of global climate models, the so-called CMIP-6 suite. Uh, this is the suite of climate models that were used as input into IPCC's sixth assessment report, which was released recently. So the color scheme is the same here. Teal colors indicate increases. The yellowish brownish colors indicate decreases. And the first uh, conclusion from this analysis is that extreme precipitation in these models also increases almost everywhere, a few exceptions being small areas in the subtropics over the oceans. Increases over the US are generally in kind of the 20, uh, 15 to 30% range. Uh, if you look globally, you see uh, places, uh, particularly along uh, in the tropics, that increase by up to 60%. So um, in the models, the models are responding to this increase in water vapor by showing extreme change or increases rather in extreme precipitation. So what does this mean for infrastructure resilience? Well, I contend that it indicates strong support for the need for updating rainfall design values to include future changes. And there are really three points I'd like to raise here. One is this historical relationship. We find in the historical record, and, and this analysis that I did involves about 200,000 extreme precipitation events across the US. This very nice monotonic relationship between the magnitude of extreme precipitation and the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Secondly, we have high certainty in the direction of change. Unless something changes fairly suddenly, uh, greenhouse gas concentrations are likely to continue to increase for some time, and this will result in future increases in global temperature following the recent uh, trends we've seen. By virtue of the Clausius-Clapeyron relationship, then we can expect increases in atmospheric water vapor. Climate models are one tool we use to investigate that. They have their limitations, but they fully support the increases in water vapor and extreme precipitation in response to increases in greenhouse gas concentrations and global temperature. Is there any scientific support for inaction? I would contend the answer is no. There are always scientific uncertainties regarding uh, the complex system that we face in, in analyzing. Um, and some, for example, one example is um, we, we could use more understanding about the changes that may vary regionally. So we've uh, the climate models show quite uniform changes, but 
will that actually occur in the future? We see his, historical trend changes that vary regionally. We see lack of a trend in the far west. That could be due to some fundamental response of the climate system to increased temperatures, or it simply could be the natural variability that thus far is masking the uh, trend out west. Are there any other barriers? Uh, one barrier is, uh, I would say, a lack of community accepted approaches to dealing with this problem. There are many uh, researchers who are working on it, but we don't have a, uh, I would say, a set of community uh, accepted best practices for doing this. And finally, there are uncertainties in all of this, and some of these uncertainties are not scientific. For example, what trajectory will greenhouse gas concentrations follow in this century? Some of that is scientific, the uncertainties, but some of it is due to, well, what decisions will society make or what technological changes might occur in the future? So it's not just about climate science. There are other uncertainties that enter, come into play. So in this project, we developed new idea values, and we did this by uh, combining two methods. We, we used two methods and we combined these in our um, IDF values that, that came out of this project. The first method was a very standard method. We used generalized extreme value statistics to analyze downscaled climate model data to produce new IDF values. This was done using the LOCA data set, downscaled data set that we used in the fourth national climate assessment. The second method was an entirely new method that we developed. And then this, this method, we quantified the changes in meteorology that cause extreme precipitation. And just like the first uh, diagram that I showed, we looked at two factors. One was water vapor, and one and the other was the weather systems that cause extreme precipitation. We did use NOAA Atlas 14 values as a baseline. NOAA Atlas 14 uh, incorporates a lot of knowledge about regional variations and local features in, uh, in extreme precipitation design values. We kept that all that information and knowledge and applied adjustment factors on top of that to incorporate climate change. Uh, we quantified projected changes in water vapor from uh, global climate models. We looked at two different scenarios, the high emission scenario for which I showed some results. And then we used a mo moderate uh, emission scenario known as RCP 4.5. We calculated changes in water vapor at various points during the 21st century from early, mid to late parts of the, the 21st century. So we have time varying IDF values. We quantified changes in relevant weather systems. The most important storm systems that we looked at were large scale mid-latitude storms, especially the fronts uh, that are associated with those storms, tropical cyclones, and in the Southwest US, we looked at the North American monsoon system. For these systems, we looked both historically, how important are they? And in the future, we analyzed uh, the changes in the climate models for the future. Well, what we found when we calculated changes, or potential changes in IDF values is that uh, perhaps no surprise, water vapor rains. That is, the, the uh, adjustment factors that we calculated were dominated by the changes in water vapor. We found a much lower uh, effect from weather system changes in the future. Okay, now let me show you some results here, projected changes in IDF values. What I have here are four scatter plots showing, comparing the current NOAA Atlas 14 IDF values, which are on the horizontal axis, with the uh, adjusted values that we calculated in this project on the vertical axis for two different time periods, mid 21st century, late 21st century, and for the two, these two scenarios that we looked at. And each of these dots indicates one station, one of our historical stations for the 24 hour, 25 year return period. You will notice that almost all of the dots 
here are to the upper left of the straight line, which is a one-to-one -one line. That is, in almost 100% of cases, our adjusted IDF values are higher than the current NOAA Atlas 14 values. So I'm going to conclude here. A few last statements. I would contend that the science is clear, that extreme precipitation increases due to warming, and this primarily arises from increases in atmospheric water vapor. Infrastructure will become increasingly vulnerable unless action is taken. So finally, uh, how does this benefit DOD? Well, use of climate-adjusted IDF curves now for infrastructure development will decrease future disruptions from infrastructure failure. Uh, thank you for your uh, attendance at this uh, seminar. Thank you so much, Ken. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. We have received eight questions so far, Ken, on the first part of this webinar. So I'm going to relay them to you, uh, starting with this one. Um, fascinating results. Were you surprised by any of your project findings, or was it expected? I think that um, it wasn't necessarily out of my expectations. Um, I thought in the end we might have somewhat larger influences from uh, weather systems changes, but it sort of it turned out that a lot of the uh, largest changes in weather systems that cause extreme precipitation tended to occur in areas where that particular weather system did not cause many extreme precipitation events. So even though the changes in the future were large, it had a relatively modest impact on the ultimate adjustment factors that we calculated. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, this is a question from an anonymous attendee. How would you analyze changes in sub-daily extreme precipitation? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that um, it's actually something we're planning to try to do more of to, to look at the sub-daily scale. A couple of challenges arise in the sub-daily scale. One, um, the data sets are not as high quality uh, for sub-daily precipitation, at least if you look across the whole U.S., if you want to do a U.S.-wide study, and uh, not necessarily as long uh, in terms of the period of record. So that's one challenge in, in trying to identify the factors that influence changes in, in the sub-daily amounts. The second challenge is when we look into the future, there's uh, relatively few model climate model simulations that actually provide data uh, or the, the, the requisite data at a sub-daily resolution. And we actually encountered a little bit of that in our CERTA project where uh, we were trying to identify fronts at a sub-daily resolution. And we were quite limited in uh, the global climate model simulations that we had available at that resolution. That's not a fundamental limitation. It's just a matter of climate models produce so much data that they have to be, they have to make decisions about what they make available just because of the storage uh, requirements from these global climate models. Uh, but it's a practical limitation. Oh, that's really useful. Thank you so much. This next question is from AFGAC from the Air Force. Does the use of duration mask some of the instantaneous changes that could be seen? Um, okay, I'm going to say that maybe that's related to the previous question, is that perhaps they're talking about uh, changes that we are observing over uh, day to multiple day uh, durations that actually, if you if you were to diagnose it, are actually short-term changes that, that are actually being the, the determining factor. And uh, kind of referring to my answer to the previous question, if indeed that is the question, uh, yes, w I think it could mask that. And um, like I say, we are in the process of trying to look at the sub-daily time scale 
and dig down deeper so we understand better and we're able to diagnose whether or not it is short-term changes uh, that are actually driving these uh, daily to multi-day duration increases. Thank you, Ken. Uh, this next question is from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, in looking at precipitable, precipitable water vapor trends across the continental U.S., you mentioned that you analyzed NCEP reanalysis data. Did you look at reanalysis data from other sources? And if so, did you see similar trends? Yeah, we did. We we were trying to do an analysis from uh, mid 20th century onwards. So when we started this project, um, NCEP, the NCEP NCAR reanalysis we thought was the best product to use. Uh, we also though did an analysis for a shorter period of record using the Mira 2 reanalysis, uh, just to um, give us some confidence that we could rely on the NCEP NCAR reanalysis. And yes, the answer is we actually found very similar results, which was um, kind of a comforting finding that on this, you know, uh, more uh, recent reanalysis with finer time resolution, we could get the same, essentially the same results. Thanks, Ken. Uh, this next question is from the Air Force Energy Installations and Environment. Um, where your future IDF values? and plot charts for all of the U.S. or globally or for certain regions of, of a country? And are you recommending that it would be best to increase current IDF curve values by the CC factor regardless of location? Um, okay, so what we produced uh, for the project was the entire coterminous U.S. except for Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And the reason we didn't do it for that, for the northwest part of the country, is there is not a NOAA Atlas 14 product that has yet been developed for that region. Now, if one were developed in the near future, and I understand that may be underway, we could easily just simply add that to, to our system. We also pro uh, provide results for Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam for certain for military installations in those three places. We have not done anything um, globally. Um, we've done the water vapor analysis globally, and we've actually done some of, some of the weather system analysis globally. But with the approach we've used to calculate an adjustment factor on top of NOAA Atlas 14, the limitation would be, is there a similar product in other areas that we could apply our adjustment factors to? Thank you, Ken. This next question is from Erda uh, from the U.S. Army. Um, sustained mega droughts occur fairly often throughout the American West as snow melt from mountains is reduced by climate change. Will the seemingly universal increase in precipitation that you presented reduce the occurrence of these droughts? And if so, should we expect a sustainably improving trend in terms of reduced drought, or should we expect a period of greater drought prior to sustained wetter weather that would lead to the reduction of these droughts? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll provide some comments on that. I think that is a really, really um, big question and one that I would say we don't have all the answers to. I think uh, what um, as a first order response to the question, what I would say is that um, we're in currently in kind of a multi-decade, two-decade period of, of very droughty conditions in the Western U.S. And um, it's been, but it's been punctuated by periodic periods of relief when we get very big storms out west. What I would say is that from our research, we would expect uh, as as we look into the future the um, magnitude of the really big events will increase in the future and they will continue to occur, that we're, we're still going to have some big events. Whether or not that re results in an overall reduction in kind of um, what I would call persistent drought conditions, I think is a question we really didn't address in this research and 
I would say is a really big question for the climate science community. So partial answer, but not a full answer. Well, thank you for taking a crack at that. Let's move on to the next question from the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Are any uh, available downscaling approaches adoptable to get up to sub-daily time steps, climate data, uh, for extreme precipitation events? Do you have any recommendations or suggestions? Yeah, that, that, that there are no, at least that I'm aware of, any um, statistically downscaled data sets that um, do sub-daily sub time resolutions. Uh, the, the one tool that, that can supply at least some information about that are dynamically downscaled uh, projections that use regional climate models. And they indeed have uh, that kind of resolution data. Uh, the challenge that usually comes from using that particular type of data is that it is very computationally expensive to generate simulations from regional climate models. And so the, say, number of simulations one has available is usually considerably smaller. Uh, and so one's kind of statistics are smaller, but that would be one avenue for uh, investigation is to try to find as many kind of high, high resolution uh, dynamically downscaled data sets as, as one can come up with. Great. And one last quick question before we turn over to Jonas's presentation and we will get back to any unanswered questions in the final Q&A. So just to wrap up, Ken, what is the major limitation, if any, of your adjusted IDF values? Right now, I would say the, the major limitation is um, that um, when we were looking at our weather system changes, um, particularly our frontal analysis, and fronts, by the way, I didn't point this out. If one looks at the causes of extreme precipitation events in the U.S., in most regions, fronts are actually the dominant uh, forcing factor. So it's very important to understand how fronts will change in the future. But in our, the method we developed, we needed sub-daily uh, climate model simulation data to examine fronts. And we had very few model simulations that we got our hands on. So what we would like to do is to get our hands on more sub-daily climate model simulations and produce a more robust estimate of how fronts might change in the future. Great. Thank you so much for a really fascinating presentation. Uh, it is now time to introduce our second presenter, uh, Dr. Jonas Demisi, who is an Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Washington State University. Jonas's current research focuses on stochastic hydrology, hydroclimatology, data mining, machine learning, and stormwater management. He has served as a PI on multiple research projects on climate change and frequency analysis of floods and droughts. Jonas has co-authored several articles and book chapters on related topics, and he received a bachelor's degree in agricultural engineering in Ethiopia, a master's degree in water resources engineering and hydro hydrology in Belgium, and a doctoral degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Really happy to have you, Jonas. Please proceed with your presentation. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining the webinar. Uh, thank you also, Sardab and the organizer for the opportunity to present our research on linked rainfall and runoff uh, intensity duration frequency in the face of uh, climate change and uncertainty. Uh, the presentation includes a brief description of the past and the future uh, trend in extreme precipitation, and then the associated uh, potential impact on DOD installations. And then I will describe the objective of the study and how we improved the rainfall and runoff IDF curve. And then we'll introduce a web-based uh, GIS portal, which contain the IDF data for the selected military installations. And then finally provide uh, some uh, conclusion remark 
and benefit to the uh, to the DOD. Most of you might be uh, familiar with this figure, uh, which shows the increase in daily uh, heavy rainfall in the United States over the past half century. Particularly, the eastern part of the country shows a significant increase in daily rainfall. And then the increase uh, trends are expected to increase in the future with the with the climate model on average pre uh, predicting up to 25 percent increase in uh, under high emission scenario or up to 50 15 percent increase under low emission uh, scenario and and this flood can, can this kind of flood can cause significant damage to the to the dod installation and its operation for example the recent flooding and the storm at all fit and Tindals are, are estimated to cost DOD about $500 billion in five years to rebuild. So in response to this trend, the Congress recently requested DOD to include flood preparation standard uh, for its uh, bases throughout the world. So under the overarching goal of reducing flood vulnerability, the objective of this project focus on updating rainfall and runoff IDF curves, taking into account the change in storms effect, the storms effect of snows and uh, modeling uncertainties. Uh, also, we aim to uh, improve understanding of flood risk at selected installation. Uh, we develop web-based GIS portal uh, for interactive access uh, to the different uh, IDF uh, data set resulted from, uh, from the project. Just, be give, just to give you a, a background, if you are not familiar with IDF curve. So basically, IDF curve is used to represent the relationship between uh, intensity, duration, and frequency of a storm and is generated by analyzing the upper tail of the rainfall distributions using frequency, uh, frequency analysis. Normally, these relationships are assumed to be, to be stationary or constant over a long period of time, but due to climate change, this stationary assumption may not be valid anymore, and as a result, uh, the, this curve might need to be updated to reflect the ongoing uh, change in storm, storm events. Uh, for our study, we focus on 13 military installations located across the US with a different climate and uh, uh, geograph uh, geographical locations. And in addition to that, we also consider the history of flooding uh, to select those, uh, those 13, uh, 13 military installations installations. We use both past and mid-century projection of precipitation to update the IDF curve using both stationary and non-stationary approach. Uh, the feature projection went through dynamic downscaling and bias correction of the data. So we will get data of like 12 kilometer resolution and 30 minute uh, time, uh, time resolutions. The results from the stationary uh, trend analysis are shown in these figures. The top figure shows the trend in the past, while the bottom figure shows the trend in the future under uh, RCP 8.5 uh, scenario. The x-axis is durations. Uh, the y-axis is uh, the military installation we, we consider for our study. And the color code represents the percentage of station, the stations showing increasing or decreasing uh, trends. And then as, as, as you can see, uh, more, more, more station, for example, up to 20% station in Fort McCoy, uh, Fort Durham, or Fort Aber Aberdeen showed increasing trend, while fewer stations showed decreasing trend in, in, in the past. Uh, and in the future, uh, the station show most of the station uh, showing increasing trend, particularly for the long duration storms, 
and a decreasing trends uh, for a shorter uh, duration uh, trends. And because of the correlations, uh, and because of the correlation among station data, we have used uh, what we call a regional uh, frequency analysis to update the IDF values. Uh, we identify, uh, first we identify climate, climatologically similar regions uh, for different storm durations, ranging from one hour to uh, 10, uh, 10 days. And then the station data are combined to develop a more accurate, accurate IDF, IDF curves. So that is one update we, we did uh, uh, from the existing IDF curve. Another update we did is, uh, in addition to considering model and parameter uncertainties, so we consider also non-stationarities in the system, but we, we consider parameter uncertainty and model, uh, model uncertainty, given that different uh, probability model can fit a given data set. So instead of selecting one, one model, we use uh, Bayesian model averaging techniques to combine the estimation uh, from the individual uh, models. And then we consider non-stationarities. Again, uh, we have time varying or uh, other uh, factor related parameters to represent the extreme, the extreme storms or to update the IDF, the IDF curves. So the result includes IDF curve under the current and future condition, uh, as, as well as the NOAA estimate uh, for, uh, for comparisons. Uh, as an example, you can see in these figures, the IDF value are expected to increase in Fort McCoy uh, under the both scenarios, under the moderate and the high climate scenario, while it may decrease in areas where uh, Fort Ar Arwine, uh, Camp Pendleton, or Yuma, which is the south uh, west side of, side of the countries. We also look uh, at the change uh, in all the IDF values as demonstrated by these figures for two different installations. On the x-axis, we have duration. Uh, on the y-axis, we have return periods and the color codes are percentage, percentage change in the storm magnitude with and without considering the future storm. And overall, adding the future data has negative or no change in short duration storm magnitudes while it will have uh, uh, increasing impact on a longer durations uh, uh, storm magnitudes. We also look at how the return period will change as a result of the change in future precipitations. Uh, the figure shows the return period under stationary conditions on the x-axis and under non-stationary condition on the y-axis. The 45 uh, degree lines uh, are shown by this red line. So if the points are above the red line, uh, like in Camp, Camp P Pendleton, it means the return periods of the storm will increase in the future. While if the points are below the red lines, it means the return period uh, in that particular installation will, will decrease. So as, as, as shown for McCoy, but if it is along the red lines, uh, like uh, McCord, Lewis McCord, then we don't see a significant change in the return period uh, when we consider the future, the future scenario. This finding can be used also to assess the risk of uh, infrastructure failure over the project time. So the risk of failure are represented uh, by solid lines for non-stationarity in these figures. So solid lines are for uh, non-stationarity condition. That means without considering the future climate and the broken lines are stationary conditions, uh, non-stationarity condition considering climate while the broken lines are stationary condition without considering, considering the climate. So if the solid lines are above the broken line, it means the risk of failure will, be, will increase under future climate or the opposite if the solid lines are below the broken, the broken line. So the risk will, will increase in McCoy 
but the risk of uh, an infrastructure uh, failure might actually decrease in, in Pendleton and no major change in macro work. Okay, because of the lack of 101 correlation between storm and flood, it is important to, to revise also the run of IDF curve in order to better understand the flood risk and design better the storm, the storm water system. For example, even if the annual maximum storm happened, in this case, in mid-September, actually the, the resulted uh, runoff is not significant. And instead, major runoff happened somewhere in, in, in January, which indicates that there might not be a direct correlation between the rainfall amount with the generated runoff at the given, at, at the given, given site. So because of that, we look uh, into the seasonalities of storms and flood for each of our sites uh, and revise the IDF curve uh, to, reflect, to reflect that seasonality, seasonality change. So what we, what we did is basically instead of uh, taking annual max, like instead of taking this maximum value to develop our IDF curve, first we identify the flood season uh, in each of our sites and then pick the maximum value of the rainfall during that, that flood season, and then use that rainfall amount to develop the IDF, the IDF curve. So if we do that, then basically this figure shows the result, and the figure shows the percentage difference in the IDF values with and without considering the flood season. Uh, overall, not considering the flood season tend to over predict uh, the flood risk associated with the storms. And then another factor we consider is the impact of snow. Uh, the impact of snow may also affect our uh, uh, runoff uh, generated from a given uh, from a given storm event. So we consider both. Uh, snow accumulation and the snow melt uh, in developing IDF curve and the snow melt increase water availability for runoff while the snow accumulation uh, will decrease uh, will decrease the water availability for runoff for example for this particular weather station the annual maximum precipitation was uh, 61 uh, millimeters if we only consider the precipitation without the snow but if we consider snow as part of our our, our analysis combined with the snow melt, the maximum water available uh, from that storm uh, in that particular year is, is, is become 80, 82 millimeter. So instead of using this value, so if we use a snow plus, a snow melt plus precipitations and develop IDF curve, and then in general, we see an increasing trend. For example, we see uh, this study for Fort Durham's uh, where snow has considerable cont uh, contribution to runoff. And we, we found approximately 25% increase in the 100 year IDF values when we consider the effect of uh, snow in, in developing the IDF uh, values. And finally, we, we also uh, developed or we also generate a grid-based runoff IDF values associated with the corresponding uh, grid-based uh, runoff, uh, grid-based rainoff, rainfall IDF. And to do that for each grid, the model identified the contributing drainage. For example, for we, we identify any grid cell and then identify uh, the contributing drainage area and then contribute runoff hydrograph associated from a given storm which is generated from rainfall IDF values. So we'll use the rainfall IDF value, run, run our model uh, for, that, for that particular watershed and have an idea what kind of hydrograph we estimate at each of those, those grid, uh, grid cells. For example, this figure shows the distribution of maxima uh, discharge resulted from, uh, resulted from uh, a spatially distributed 100 year storm. Uh, such result will be helpful in sizing the storm, the storm water systems and for other uh, drainage, uh, drainage applications. So instead of now talking about rainfall values at a given uh, point, now we can give 
what will be the potential runoff associated from a given uh, design design storms. Uh, we can look into the progress, how the uh, runoff depths will change over time. For example, this figure shows uh, runoff depths after uh, 10 hours of precipitation from a uh, hundred year uh, storms and so on. And then we can see difference and all kinds of interesting results that may, that may be used in again sizing our, our storm motor systems and so on. Okay, so finally we develop uh, uh, a web portal, which is a GIS uh, portal, and it's very interactive with a self introductory uh, component involved in there. And then for anyone who are interested in the data, I think it's, it's, it's uh, free for public ac access. So we can go there and then uh, get all the data uh, resulted from, uh, from, the, uh, from the study. So we can choose the precipitation type, uh, what kind of scenario, precipitation with the snow, hydrographs, uh, or we can also choose the historical feature data and all, all, those, uh, all those information. It's a grid base and you can also look into at the point at the station, the station values. So in conclusion, storm intensity and frequency uh, have increased at most installation, uh, particularly for storm with longer durations. Yeah. And then the, inc the increasing trend are expected to continue at a faster rate in the future. And in terms of benefit to DOD, uh, the IDF result generated from this result uh, is available for certain military uh, installation considering both the non-stationary the non-stationarity aspect of the storm, uncertainty, flood uh, flood seasonalities, snow effects, and then the flood risk also was assessed under both stationarity and non-stationarity assumptions. Runoff IDF curve is developed for most of the site, and then we have a GIS tool that can that can easily be used uh, to access the the data, uh, download and use it for. Uh, either uh, upgrading our storm motor system or redesign a new, a new one. And overall, uh, we assume that the, the study result will contribute to the military re readiness and resilience to trees uh, posed by uh, future climate change. So this is just to acknowledge our uh, PIs, and then there are a couple of students and postdocs involved, involved in the project. Again, thank you for your attendance and thank you for the opportunity to present our, our study. Thank you so much, Jonas. We've received uh, a number of questions. We're gonna start off with one from, the, from uh, AFTAC. Are soils and, veg and vegetation changes taken into account for runoff calculations? Yes, uh, that's correct. But uh, under the current run of simulation we did, we haven't considered a future changes in, in land use, but I think that's something we can uh, incorporate to reflect the change in vegetation and other changes in the land use. But the current run of IDF curve generated from this study assumes the land use uh, relatively stays uh, same as what, what it is now in the future. Wonderful. Uh, the second question is from Florida International University. Does the uh, rainfall during flood season affect floods? And why take the maximum rainfall during the flood season for your uh, calculations? Yeah, as I try to explain in that slide, uh, for example, in, uh, in that particular example, the maximum rainfall happened in September pretty much it might be at the end of summer. So soil moisture content might not be that significant. Uh, soil might be dry. Uh, a flash flood might be possible, but from the data, we didn't see any significant increase in the runoff. So purely relying on maximum rainfall as, a, as an indicator for uh, runoff uh, might be wrong under that, that scenario, given the maximum flood happened uh, during winter even if we don't have a significant, significant rainfall during, during that period. 
Great, thank you. This next question is related to your uh, web portal on slide 64. Um, this sounds like a really amazing tool. One of the audience members is uh, would like for you to elaborate on how they can get access to the web portal if some sort of uh, sign-in requirements are in place. Uh, currently, it's, it's, it's just to click the, the link uh, attached there. Uh, I should take you directly to the website. But we plan to just collect data, maybe login uh, access, just to know uh, who is logging. But currently, there is no restrictions. It's, it's, it's free, pa pa available for a wide public, uh, public use. No restriction. And then there is a self-introductory in the, in the landing page it shows you, it gives you a brief description what kind of data it contains. It's not that complex website, but again, you have extra, extra help if, if needed. You can have a graded data or there will be point associated, a station associated data from the site, but no restriction at, at this stage. That's really amazing. Thank you so much, Yona. Um, this is a question from an anonymous attendee. Is there a way to estimate IDF changes for international locations for which we may not have um, ready access to meteorological information or modeling resources. Yeah, so when, when we talk about IDF tools, I mean, we heavily rely on data. Uh, I mean, what you got is, uh, is a result of data qualities. Yeah, as long as there is enough data, uh, to do the historical analysis, I think uh, for the future data, it's still down a scale. In, in this case, we use a 30 minute uh, time resolution for the and 12 kilometer resolution. That's a fine detail or a fine resolution. Uh, I don't think we, ha we currently have that level of uh, uh, refined data at international scale. But if the data is available, uh, in terms of methodology, I don't see I don't see any major uh, major uh, issues implementing that. But um, the main challenge will be having those quality data to have to have reasonable reasonable results. Great, thank you. Uh, can you uh, tell us whether the observed changes in storm intensity and frequency, uh, whether they're limited to natural? variabilities or are they associated with something else yeah at the beginning of the uh, the project i think we, we we have done a lot of work in terms of isolating the different trends uh, in terms of variabilities linear trend and linear trends and, and so on but overall yeah we, we look into the natural variabilities uh, and the trend we see the one we report is above those those natural natural variabilities. We even consider the possibility of having nonlinear trends in, in the system or in the data. Thank you, Jonas. And do the observed changes in storms translate to similar changes in stormwater runoff and floods? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean. In, in some cases, we saw uh, the, the change in the runoff might exceed the, cha the, the, the change we may see in the precipitation. But overall, uh, it's hard to directly correlate uh, the change we are seeing in storms with the change, uh, with the expected change in, in, in runoff. In the scientific community, there is a lot of ongoing discussions and a lot of new publications to try to see whether this ch the change in storm event we're seeing can directly translates to uh, translates to the uh, to runoff. But yeah, so it's a hard question to answer. But uh, in some cases we see a, a direct correlation, but in, in in another case we may not see any any direct correlations. You know, and we're getting a lot of comments that. Uh, error messages are being received uh, when people try to sign into the web portal. Um, would you welcome emails directly to you um, for, for assistance in accessing the portal? If we could move to the slide prior that shows Jonas's email address, would that be something acceptable? 
that's acceptable i think yeah part of the team might be already in the in the webinar so they they will yeah they could address that 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 part so, yeah it should be accessible right. but we, thank yeah. you so if there are any issues for those of you experiencing trouble with the portal uh perhaps download the slides from the webinar webpage make sure you have the correct link and if you continue to have problems once you've accessed the slides please contact Jonas directly at the email shown on the slide. All right, uh, maybe two more questions before we pull uh, Ken back into the discussion. Um, what sources of uncertainty, uncertainty have you considered to quantify the uncertainty range on the IDF curves, Jonas? Yes, currently we, we are considering model uncertainties given that you may we make we saw that different extreme probability distribution can fit a given data set. So instead instead of just picking one model, we are considering multiple models. So model uncertainty is considered. And on top of that, we also quantify the uncertainty associated with uh, parameter estimations. And then we also look into from the climate side scenario based uncertainty. So we have, I think, two models uh, and uh, two scenarios into into our into our analysis. But in terms of the direct 95 control interval I showed in, the, in one of the slides, it is the, is the result of model and parameter uh, uncertainties. Great, thank you so much, Jonas, for a really clear presentation. At this point, we're gonna pull Ken back into the discussions. We have two questions for Ken, one from the US Army at Fort Bragg and one from AFGAC. So Ken, um, we uh, have a question uh, specific to, um, to the tool um that you discussed uh it, whether there are additional uh, information um uh available that you can share with this audience um this is we're talking about the the tool interface and the link through through noaa yeah i think what i um would like to do is um if people can send me a um email to my email address on the slides, and I will provide the credentials to um, access the system. Right now, it's not just an open link; it requires, um, you know, uh, access to it. Um, and I'd, uh, I, I'd be happy to give anybody access to it. Um, I probably should just add that we, I am pondering whether to um, incorporate CMIP six data into the water vapor adjustment factor portion of the method. And um, I might do that at some point in the next three months or so. I don't think it'll affect the results very much. It might affect them a little bit, but I am considering that as a um, uh, possible change. Does everybody right. have my sl <laughs> slide through, Lou, or do you wanna pop that slide up uh, for people to jot down my email address? Uh, let's let's go to your slide, but just a reminder, the slides for today's presentation are available to download from the third of an ESCCP webinar webpage specific to this webinar. A recording of this webinar will be made available in less than a week, but a PDF of the slides is available right now for download. So you can go and download the slides and on the slides you'll be able to uh, copy from the slides you'll be able to copy and paste uh, Ken's uh, email address which is also shown here so thank you Ken um, mm -hmm. we have another question for you from AFGAC is there a need to include what feedbacks are coming from vegetation and vegetation changes with respect to changes in extreme weather events um, that are captured in your work Yeah, that um, would not be incorporated. Because, uh, we're using the uh, CMIP, you know, uh, suite of models, and you know, and generally, um, they would not be incorporating that kind of effect. Um, although I do take that back, I, the Earth system models might be doing that, so there might be something. But there's no, um, 
what would I call purposeful incorporation of possible feedback effects in the climate system on extreme precipitation. Great, thank you so much. And then one final question for both you and uh, Jonas, and we'll start with you, uh, Ken. Um, do you have any suggestions on expanding adoption of climate change adjusted IDS values in the broader user community? So if you don't mind jumping in to answer that, and then we'll conclude with Jonas's statement. Yeah, so I've been, um, this is a really big problem or big challenge. Um, and we haven't yet generally grappled with it, you know, as a, as a nation or as a society, um, this great potential. A lot of infrastructure is built for many decades lifetimes, and they're uh, very highly likely to experience a enhanced extreme uh, environment. And But it's very difficult to know how to approach that problem because we not only have the scientific issues, we also have the sort of societal issues. Uh, to deal with, and how does one actually go about incorporating that into planning? So I have advocated that um, federal government should direct the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to um, put together a group that would actually, a group of experts that incorporates both university researchers, uh, uh, some of our professional societies, federal agencies, and, and other experts that are relevant to come up with a, a set of recommendations for how we as a society can move forward in, in, in smartly planning for the possibility of increases in extreme precipitation. So that's my um, suggestion. Great idea, Ken. Jonas, would you like to add any other suggestions before we wrap up? Rula, if you remind me what the question is. Yes, how do we increase adoption, wider adoption in the user community of these revised IDF curves? Okay. Yeah, so currently I think the science community have been, uh, I think start producing results that really may help in, in adapting some of, uh, I think the structure or some of the engineering practice uh, so th 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 there need to be some qualitative uh, or quantitative uh, kind of assessment that should guide in how to revise some of our engineering practice and uh, some of the designing standards. That way, I think the practitioner or a broader community can utilize those, those information. So the study, sim study like us and Keynes, I think, at the end, it, it will be beneficial if uh, end up uh, to the practitioner in a more qualitative, in a more meaningful way than the publication or scientific uh, scientific uh, assessment. But give give this this uh, and it, uh, give some some concrete result to tell in what way our infrastructure will fail or what what we should do. Uh, so giving that. Uh, information may help uh, in, uh, in our adapting, adapting strategies. Thank you so much, Jonas. And thank you again, Ken. We're gonna go ahead and conclude and remind you all that the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the webinar pa uh, page that we've been referencing and we've included another link to that in the uh, chat box for the webinar. So before we conclude, I would just like to remind you all that um, these webinars happen every two weeks and our next webinar will take place on Thursday, October 21 on DOD, on DOD funded research efforts to advance stormwater monitoring, management, and treatment at DOD facilities. The webinar will feature two speakers, Molly Colvin from the Naval Information Warf Warfare Center Pacific and Richard uh, Lucy from Stanford University. Registration is open, so please visit the CERDAP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other future webinars through the end of this year. 
Uh, we would appreciate it at this time if you can please take a quick moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your attention.